Well, today we're continuing to film in our video studio that's under development. <laughs> the future room will look a lot different to this one. But we're in Athens today, in Acts chapter 17. Paul goes to the cultural capital of the Roman world, the city of Athens, and you'll notice that his preaching in Athens is different to his preaching in other places because he culturizes his gospel presentation to the people that he speaks to. Anyway, let us read. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. Paul, as was his custom, went into them and for three Sabbath days reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. Some of them were persuaded and they joined Paul and Silas of the devout Greeks, a great multitude and not a few of the chief women. But the unpersuaded Jews took along some wicked men from the marketplace and gathering a crowd, they set the city into an uproar. Assaulting the house of Jason, they sought to bring them out to the people. When they didn't find them, they dragged Jason and certain brothers before the rulers of the city, crying, these who have turned the world upside down have come here also, whom Jason has received. These all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. The multitude and the rulers of the city were troubled when they heard these things. When they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Many of them therefore believed also of the prominent Greek women and not a few men. But when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul at Berea, they came there and likewise agitated the multitudes. Then the brothers immediately sent Paul to go as far as to the sea and Silas and Timothy stayed there. But those who escorted Paul brought him as far as Athens receiving a commandment to Silas and Timothy that they should come to him very quickly, and they departed. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked because he saw the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who met him. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also were conversing with him. Some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be advocating foreign deities because he preached Jesus and the resurrection. They took a hold of him and brought him to the Areopagus saying, may we know what this new teaching is and what you are speaking about. For you bring certain strange things to our ears. We want to know therefore what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the strangers living there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Paul stood in the middle of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that you are very religious in all things. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. What therefore you worship in ignorance, I announce to you. The God who made the world and all things in it he, being Lord of heaven and earth, doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. He isn't served by men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing as he himself gives to all life and breath and all things. He made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the surface of the earth, having determined appointed seasons and the boundaries of their dwellings, that they should seek the Lord, and if perhaps they might reach out for him and find him, although he's not far from each of us. In him we live and move and have our being. As some of your poets have said, we are his offspring. Being then the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone engraved by art, the design of men. The times of ignorance, therefore, God overlooked. 
But now he commands that all people everywhere should repent, because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man he has ordained, of which he has given assurance to all men, because he raised him from the dead. Now, when they heard of this resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, we want to hear you again concerning this. Thus Paul went out from among them, but certain men joined with him and believed, among whom also was Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others. Well, Paul is in the middle of the second missionary journey. In the previous chapter, they are in Philippi. They get um, escorted out of the city. <laughs> Paul always seems to leave places in interesting circumstances. And in Acts chapter 17, they're in three places, Thessalonica, Berea, and then Paul in Athens. In Thessalonica, we notice that the pronoun changes from we back to they. Now, I meant to talk to you about this pronoun thing in the ch chapter 16, but I forgot, and that was a long video. But the, um, the pronoun, Luke is the writer of the book of Acts, and he never mentions himself by name, but he travels with Paul. And when he's with Paul, and he's talking about what happens to Paul, if he's with Paul, the pronoun says, we did this and we did that. Um, so you can tell that Luke's with him. But what happens is, in the start of the second missionary journey, Paul gets to Troas, this is in chapter 16, and it says, we set out for th Samothrace, like the, it's the we. Luke is from Troas, he's going with Paul, they go up to Philippi. But then in this chapter, they go to Thessalonica and it's back to they again. Luke stays behind in Philippi and apparently he's there for years, three to four years. And then later on, when Paul is back at Philippi again, he just visits briefly, the we pronouns start back up again. So Luke does travel with Paul a fair bit, but it seems like he stays in Philippi. So why, we don't know. But I wonder whether after seeing the church start there with Lydia and the jailer, that Luke is left behind by Paul, I'm just guessing, to encourage and strengthen the church and make sure it does well. Then in chapter 17, Paul goes to Thessalonica. He's only there a few weeks. It says he reasoned in the synagogue for three Sabbaths, and it says he had great fruit. Jews believe, but a lot of Gentiles, including prominent women. But then the unpersuaded Jews um, don't like it, and he ends up... Um, he ends up leaving the city. It says that, that they were accused um, of causing an out, you know, they were accused of basically stirring up an uproar. And Jason, a local Christian there called Jason, had to post bond. In other words, he's charged, but they won't put him in jail if he puts up security. And the security is, we don't know what it was. It could have been his house, or it could have been something was the security. But if Paul had stayed in Thessalonica, it would have risked Jason's security and his possessions. He would never have got it back. So Paul leaves and goes to Berea. And it says that the people of Berea were of more noble character because they studied the scriptures to see if what Paul was saying was true. These are the Jewish people. In Thessalonica, a lot of people became Christians. Obviously, they were noble. <laughs> but it's these other ones that stirred up stirred up all the problems, they were the non-noble ones. But in Berea, it says they were noble. Now, because it says that, that they studied the scriptures and they were noble, all around the world now, there are things that are named after this city of Berea. There's the Berean Bible Institute, <laughs> the Berean Bible College. There's, all, there's Berean lots of things all around the world in Christianity because these people of Berea were noble <laughs> and they studied the word of God and don't we all want to do that? And so, but then again, the people of Thessalonica came, the unbelieving Jews of Thessalonica came and stirred up trouble in Berea and they left again. But this time, Paul goes on his own. So he leaves Luke and Philippi and then he leaves Silas and Timothy in Berea but then we find out from the very first epistle that Paul writes, the letter to the Thessalonians, that Timothy gets sent back to Thessalonica. So Paul moves on to Athens, but he leaves Luke and Philippi. He leaves 
Timothy in Thessalonica and Silas in Berea. He leaves one in each of these three places and they go on strengthening the churches and helping those people. But Paul himself is in Athens. So we've got this, it's the second missionary journey, but we end up with this team of four, but they're in four different places all at the exact same time. It's super interesting. And if you go and read the letter to the Thessalonians chapter one, Paul, it, it's like he's only just left Thessalonica like a few months before, and he's written them this letter. And he said, we were worried about your faith, whether it would stay strong or not. We couldn't bear, he said, I couldn't bear to leave you. I've sent Timothy to you. So that's in this moment where he's left, he's gone to Berea, he's about to go to Athens and he says, Timothy, I think you gotta go back to Thessalonica and find out if they're doing okay. So go and check out Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter one, and it'll fit nicely into this part of Acts that we've just read. So Paul is now in Athens and he's waiting for the others to catch up with him. Luke won't catch up with him, but he's waiting for the other two. And as he's wandering around the city, he notices idols and statues everywhere. This is uh, Greece, you know, the, the cultural capital of the ancient Roman world. And they had, you know, temples to all sorts of gods and and um, you can go to, to visit um, Greece today and you can go to the Parthenon and all these famous places. Well, they were there in the time of Paul and he saw them. And as he's wandering around the city, he's bothered by it all. He's bothered by seeing all these idols and he realizes that idolatry was rampant. Like the whole of the Roman world was affected by it, but he could tell that it all came from here. And um, he no doubt prayed a lot, but then he notices that there's, a, there's an idol or a statue to an unknown God. I'm gonna tell you about that because there's a book I read um, as a younger Christian called Eternity in Their Hearts by Don Richardson. And it's one of the very best Christian books I've ever read. Um, over the years, you know, you read a lot of, I've read hundreds, maybe thousands of Christian books. And, uh, but every now and then one of them stands out as just a, better than everything else. And one of those recent ones was the King Jesus Gospel by Scott McKnight. But one of the ones I read as a younger Christian was Eternity in Their Hearts by Don Richardson. And Don Richardson was saying that God, um, he makes sure that people of all times and cultures and places, they may, even if they never had a missionary, the gospel is presented to these people in a way that, there's a, that they could respond in faith. Some people say, oh, God's so unfair. You know, what about the people who never got to hear about Jesus? Well, this book, Eternity in Their Hearts, will answer that question for you. And um, so in the city of Athens, you know, in the cultural hub of the, of the Greek and Roman empires, there's this altar to the unknown God, but it's actually an altar to God. And so uh, Don Richardson explains the background of this altar. He researched it but there was a plague in the city of Athens. And um, they prayed to all the different gods and nothing was stopping this plague. But uh, let, me, let me look up here. I think I've got the name of this. Uh, it was, yeah, Don Richardson got this information from an ancient writer called Epimenides of Crete. And um, in um, Athens, they, uh, they were trying to offer sacrifices to all their various gods. Nothing was working, but this Epimenides of Crete reported that they believed that there was another God, a God that they didn't know, a God that was more powerful, that if they would pray to him and offer a sacrifice to him, that he would stop the plague. And so they offer this sacrifice to this God, but they don't know who his name is. But they, they say, Lord, we're sorry, we don't know your name, but we honor you. And, and then the plague stops. So this is in the history of Athens. So as a result of that, in the city of Athens, an altar is built to the unknown God, but it's the Lord. <laughs> and so the Lord puts this altar there as a sign to himself. It's an opportunity to anyone with faith to believe, but it's also something the Lord builds into the Athenian culture so that when Paul comes along, he can proclaim it to them more clearly. And that's the reason why we need missionaries because the Lord has put in every culture in the world these, these things where anyone with faith can find the Lord and believe, but missionaries are able to come along and explain it well. And as a result, many more will believe. The Lord still commands us to go and preach. So Paul ends up in Athens. 
the Lord opens the door for him to preach in the Areopagus on Mars Hill, which is like the, it's like the, uh, the forum of all the academics, all the, the PhDs of philosophy in Athens, all the experts were all there, always discussing the latest ideas, and Paul gets to speak to them. And uh, as a result of that, he leads a man to the Lord called Dionysius, and a woman gets saved called Damaris, and that's the beginning of the church at Athens. And in Athens today, there is a St. Dionysius church named after that very, very first Athenian Christian. So all of that is super cool. You'll notice that when he preaches to the Athenian philosophers, he doesn't quote the Old Testament. There's no Old Testament quotes. When he preaches in synagogues and other chapters, he's quoting Old Testament. So Paul adjusts what he's saying to suit the audience. And, you know, you and I, we can learn how to do that too. So, uh, you know, if you're pre talking to your next-door neighbour about Jesus, no point filling their head up with all this Old Testament stuff they've got no clue about. Just talk to them about what Jesus has done for you. Let your testimony speak to them. Now... Some people have said, this is probably going to be the last point, some people have said that Christianity is not logical and uh, it's only about faith, you know, and they think of faith as being some kind of like irrational leap in the dark that you make <laughs> where you kind of like just try to believe in something despite all logic. But actually... There are wonderful intellectual and logical arguments to be made for Christianity. And here in this chapter, Paul goes to the intellectual, the top of the Roman Greek world with the highest thinking people, academics, and he preaches an intellectual version of the gospel and academic people get saved. And um, the Christian message is highly intelligent. It's highly academic. And in fact, that's where logic comes from. In the book of Romans, it says, uh, and we'll get to Romans chapter one. But when people dispense with the Lord, they dispense with their reason to think properly. But when you have the Lord, it's from the Lord that proper thought comes. <laughs> Father, I want to thank you for Paul and his preaching in Athens. I thank you that his words have blessed us and encouraged us down to this very day. And I pray you'd help us all to, to do better and better at sharing the gospel with those around us, people at work or people, at our neighbours or family. Help us, Lord, not to, Lord, not to be afraid, but Lord, give us, Lord, the ability to relax and just be ourselves in speaking to them. And Lord, in the same way that Paul was able to impact people, even at the highest levels of society, Lord, help us as Christians today to be impacting on those around us. In Jesus' name, amen.